Okay, so um, I would now like to introduce, um, I'm just going to give a brief summary of some of Sue's, um, the highlights of her career. She spent 15 years working as a clinical and research midwife. And in 2001, she joined the um, UK University of Central Lancashire, where she is now a professor of midwifery studies. Her main research focus is the nature of and cultures around normal birth. She's held leadership positions in several international uh, maternal child health organizations. She's a lead author on the Lancet Midwifery series. She's been involved in a range of projects with the Fernandez Foundation and the University of Hyderabad in India. And you will hear several of those, about several of those projects later in our conference. Her keynote presentation today will, will explore some of the issues arising from the apparent conflicts between professional and vocational approaches to midwifery and maternity care. So welcome, Sue. I'm going to go ahead and make you the presenter. And I'm going to turn off my video and sit back and enjoy your presentation and monitor the chat. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you for the invitation very much. And I have to say, I'm, I, I don't know, I'm not, I was a co-author on the Lancet series, not the lead author, so I just need to clarify that. Co-author on one of the, the Lancet series papers and part of the team that put the, 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 group, the whole um, set of papers together. So just to make sure that's accurate. So it, it's a great pleasure to be here, um, despite, as we were discussing earlier on before we came online, the, the cold and the wind and the rain in the UK at the minute, which is very unseasonable. In fact, this evening in our house, we lit a fire, a wood, a wood burning fire, which is unheard of on the 5th or 4th or 5th of May. But anyway, it can only get better, as everybody says. So I, I want to kind of, so some of you may have heard some pieces of this uh, presentation before. I did have a, uh, some of it was presented at the Royal College of Midwives this year, but I wanted to run through it again, really, because I think there's quite, there's some important questions to be asked, perhaps as midwifery becomes more and more professionalised, and particularly, and this is very, um, a very valuable and very welcome move, as midwifery becomes seen as a solution, partly because of the ser midwifery series, but also because a range of countries are beginning to recognise that they actually need to invest in midwives going forward into the future. So I kind of wanted to come back to this notion of how vocation and profession might sit together, because there's always a risk with any group that, that rapidly professionalizes that one can lose sight of what the roots of the, the, uh, the, you know, the activities that we're doing, or in this case, the vocation we're describing, where they come from. And, and I think it's also very important for us as research, those of us who are researchers, to recognize that the, the findings that we have from the research that show how useful and how important midwifery is are findings that are rooted in this vocation. And if we strip the vocation out and only, only focus on the profession, then we may actually not, not get the kinds of results that our current research is showing we, we want to get, you know, the results on which this shift towards more midwifery and more midwifery training is based. So I want to just kind of put Put that question in the mix really and hopefully we'll have enough time to have a debate about where we might sit on this continuum and i've chosen this particular um slide because the idea that the future perfect continuous tense is that it's always moving forward but never quite there you know it's a tense which describes the future that isn't quite arrived at and so this idea is about becoming something rather than being something becoming something which is maybe a blend of vocation and profession and underneath that to use that to ensure that we really do have birth equity for all, which is the kind of overall um, framing of this event. So this is just a, you know, a picture off the net really, but I think it, it describes the situation very well that I want to talk about. You know, where is that sweet spot, that sweet spot of purpose, in the like in the center of this graph here, that actually combines something that you love, that the world needs, that you're paid for, always good, um, and that you're really good at. You know, where, where do those things come together, particularly around this notion of passion and compassion? So that, you know, being compassionate is about doing something with passion. And being a midwife has to be done with passion, otherwise it's just a job, and that's not what midwifery is. So 
I think that this notion of where professionalism slides into managerialism and bureaucracy is really the space I'm wanting to kind of um, warn against, I suppose. So not I don't want to warn against professionalism as a notion, because there are some some very valuable values that are associated with profession as a notion, you know, values of ethics and morality and all those kinds of things. But it's this this slide between profession and managerialism of bureaucracy that I think is the issue. And this particular quote is from quite an interesting paper, which is actually focused on uh, doctors' acceptance or resistance to knowledge management, so guidelines and rules and safety cultures and so on. And And what the quote suggests is that what happens is that professions tend to adapt to this kind of neoliberal bureaucracy in ways that sometimes mean that, in this particular case, doctors become managers. If you like, in order to resist managerialism, they create themselves into managers in this particular study, or they create themselves into bureaucracy, so adopt some of the bureaucracy so that they can control it. But in controlling it, they also become, become, um, become kind of beholden to it. And there's this, this concern about how that works its way out and I also think that there's there's this other piece about knowledge and wisdom and again I think this is important particularly for those who are working um, as researchers and lecturers as, as it seems like many educationalists as it seems like a number of people on this particular um, session are because knowledge without wisdom or knowledge with with wisdom is incredibly important so having information but using it rightly so the capacity to judge rightly is what wisdom is is not the same as having a checklist of things that are, that's based on population evidence and going yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, all the way down the checklist. That's not wisdom. It might be knowledge, but it's not wisdom. So this other quote, again, illustrates the point. You know, wisdom is a profound understanding and a deep insight. And it's also a capacity to, to both at the same time see the whole picture and the detail. So look, look both you know, the, in the focus of something and also in the wider picture at the same time. So to constantly shift between those perspectives. So whereas, generally speaking, um, guideline-based or rules-based or protocol-based uh, evidence is about the whole picture, the population, so what works across the population, what we need to do as midwives and also as obstetricians, as our colleagues, is to keep the individual in focus at the same time as understanding that broader population evidence. And that's where wisdom comes in, the right use of knowledge. And I, I've, I've used this quote a lot, and people, people may know it, but it's, um, it's from Hilary Rose, who's a, a feminist scientist, writes about feminist science, or wrote about it. It's quite an old quote, but still. So this, this idea that the origin science story is about knowledge and power, but feminist critique of it is about the danger of knowledge without love, in this case, caritas, that kind of love, the love of caring, caring for and caring with. Um, and again, this is a notion that I think we need to keep in the mix. It's a vocational notion balanced with a professional notion, I would argue. So I want to just kind of row back a little bit and say, okay, if, if our vocation is about women and about um, women and birthing people and newborns and the families, then we should be doing what matters to them the most. And of course, you know, you can look at that in terms of satisfaction, but satisfaction is a very poor measure of anything. Most people, if you ask them, you know, if you ask people what they think about their local shoe shop, 80% are going to say they're satisfied. Generally, unless people are really unhappy, about 80% comes out, you know, in any satisfaction study, about 80 odd percent tend to be satisfied. So it's a very, it's a very kind of low level uh, way of, of assessing how people feel about things. So. This particular slide here shows the data that um, are ge were generated by a series of studies that we've, we did for the World Health Organization, looking at the qualitative evidence of what matters to women, both antenatal, intrapartum, and postnatally, so a, a range of different studies. And this particular, um, the intrapartum metasynthesis was 35 studies in 19 countries, as you can see. And what mattered most was a positive experience, not just a satisfy, satisfying experience or satisfactory experience, I should say, but a positive experience that fulfills or exceeds their prior personal and sociocultural beliefs and expectations. And that was the kind of flavor of what we found across, across these, um, these particular reviews for each period of time that we looked at. So it's far more than just being safe and feeling satisfied. And this is a, a you know an unpacking of that intrapartum one a bit more. So what though what that meant was to obviously give birth to a healthy baby in a in a safe environment clinically and psychologically. That's kind of almost a given. Practical and emotional support 
from everybody around them. Most women around the world, in most, we looked at every language, every country, every study that we could find around the world, wanted a physiological labour and birth. But most of them also acknowledged that there was a need to go with the flow, that you know, sometimes that isn't how it was. So they were happy to go with the flow. And if they did need an intervention, then again, this, this is, won't be a surprise to anybody on this call, what we, women wanted was to still maintain that sense of personal achievement and control by being involved in decision making, or at least by trusting their caregivers to make the right decision. And not to make a decision because the tick box says, or because the professional organization says, or because um, if, if the midwife doesn't, or the doctor doesn't do it, they're gonna get told off, or you know, hold over the coals at some kind of review session. They wanted it because they, 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 were, they wanted uh, interventions that were necessary and required by them, done in a way that was compassionate and caring and, took account of their cultural norms and beliefs. And I'm not sure you can see the Maslow's hierarchy here because the slides are a bit small, but what we, we thought was that really this did relate to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And that the reason we've got, you've got the shadow triangle on there is that it seems to us that most maternity care systems and actually a lot of health systems at the moment concentrate on the bottom two lines of Maslow's hierarchy. So physiological needs um, in terms of food and water and so on and um, safety needs and all the other needs the esteem needs the belongingness the love the self-fulfillment that are at the top of Maslow's hierarchy don't seem to be taken into account in many ways that we do maternity care but they are part of the midwifery vocation and one thing we might want to discuss is how you can operationalize this kind of um, approach that matters to women and I think there's also this notion of how we use wisdom in research translation so this is the arrived trial most of you will know the arrived trial I imagine so a trial, well, a very well designed trial in, in a number of sites in America, looking at labor induction at 39 weeks routinely for primigravid women, actually niloparis women, um, versus no routine induction. And they did, it was lots of women, 6,000 odd, and they found, they didn't, they were looking for neonatal adverse outcomes and found no difference. So there was no difference to the baby at all during the induction, but it did actually reduce their section, secondary outcome. And of course, you know, as we all know, that's now the, the, um, the aspect that's being propounded for routine early induction for women. There was also not much difference in, in measures of pain relief or women's sense of, um, I don't know what they use of it, some VAS score, I think, I can't quite see the details here because the slide's too small for women's sense of well-being. But of course, the important thing, again, as many will know, is that 73% of eligible women did not agree to take part in this study indicating that most women do not want to be induced routinely. And um, the median BMI in both groups was over 30, and generally women in the study were younger than the norm and more likely to be African-American. So the question is, what's the external validity of this particular study? Does it, although it was well-designed, does it actually reflect what women want? It was only niliparous women. Can you actually apply it to those who are not niliparous? And it was only a quarter of the, the participate of the population that were eligible. Possibly more women took part who wanted to be induced than the average in the population, because otherwise they wouldn't have, they, you know, they wouldn't have taken part. Clearly, uh, one study, one country. And th I think the most intriguing thing about this is that um, induction is being propounded now as a way of reducing cesarean section. The reason we want to reduce cesarean section is because we realise there are long-term effects. We have no idea what long-term effects of induction are, you know, beyond the first few days. And yet we're using it as a technique to reduce a technique that we want to reduce because we now know there's long-term effects. It's illogical to me, especially when we have alternatives. If we really want to reduce the zero section, that's fine, you know, reduce it safely, that's fine. But actually, if you look at the uh, support in labour trials, the Cochrane support in labour trials, they reduce cesarean section by, by more. There's a greater reduction in cesarean section in those trials than there is in the arrived trial. And there are multiple trials from multiple countries, far more women involved. And there's very unlikely to be any long term adverse outcomes. And equally for place of birth, the evidence seems to be, not randomised trials, but seems to be that women birthing, women who, who are um, healthy, baby, healthy babies who want to birth out of hospital, who have good support in countries with, with good infrastructure, do better out of hospital generally than in the hospital, and so do their babies, unless it's a first time mum having a home birth, in which case slightly more risk for the baby on the UK data, and also from other countries too, that's been found. But definitely fewer interpartum interventions and more normal births and less cesarean sections. So if you want to reduce cesarean, 
then you should be looking at the gold standards for reducing caesarean and not comparing induction with no induction and then concluding that induction is the only way you can reduce caesarean section. And of course the problem is, and this is why I come back to the military vocation versus profession, because and understandably what's happening certainly in the UK is quite a lot of uh, midwives are working to create um, home induction. So it, the, the line is, well, women have to be induced. They don't have to be induced, actually, but you know, this is the line. Women are going to be induced anyway. Let's make it as good as possible for them. So let's do the induction at home. Now, the problem with that is we have no idea what the consequences are, really. You know, we don't yet know because we haven't done the research of home induction, firstly. Secondly, induction should only really be done if there's a risk, really. So, you know, if you're going to be doing an induction, why are you doing it at home? If there are, you know, if there may be issues, then presumably that's not where the woman should be. And it raises this question about too much medicine, because if it becomes acceptable to do an induction at home, you can just imagine that what might happen as we get remote, remote fetal monitoring, for example, is that the, there'll be a kind of like, well, if we're going to do the induction at home, we should be monitoring, especially if we get any adverse events, this will happen. We should be doing monitoring, but we can monitor at home, so that's OK. And actually, while we're monitoring at home for induction, we might as well monitor at home for home birth. Let's do continuous fetal monitoring remotely at home for home birth, and we can watch the monitors in the hospital, and that's going to be safe for everybody will be the argument, which of course is not going to be, the, that, won't be, that wouldn't be true. But you can see the risk of technology creep once you start to bring this, these kinds of feeling, this idea that this has to be done into a setting where it's anathema really in many ways. And then you start breaking down the boundaries and you lose the sight. Again, it comes back to what I was saying at the beginning. You lose the sight as to why the thing, in this case, home birth, works because actually you start to introduce things into that setting that mean it don't, doesn't work. And therefore you get adverse events and therefore people say, well, home birth is dangerous and therefore you lose that home birth space. So I think from the vocational perspective, we need to be thinking through the consequences of some of the things that we do as workarounds. And then from a professional perspective, we should be saying, well, actually we shouldn't be doing the workarounds because there are alternatives that don't require the workarounds that are much more in line with the middle free vocation. And there is a risk of overextending risk of risk diagnosis and again you may not be able to see this this is a cover from a few years ago in the bmj and i think it's great and it's nothing to do with maternity it's, a, it's general and they say there's a there's a, a risk at, at the moment of over medicalization because we start by arming the health that's what we intend to do with with medicine on, and and general health care and then we move into alarming the healthy by over testing and over screening and then we move into harming the healthy because actually but we, we over screen we over diagnose we over treat and the conclusion is overdiagnosis is one of the most harmful and costly problems in modern healthcare. And I would include some of the routine interventions that we're doing in that in that box. And I think again, our response during COVID is, is quite illustrative of what our dominant mental models, not ours necessarily in this group, but the dominant mental models of healthcare in general and maternity care specifically are. And you know, we all know the tragic stories of you know people in general being separated from families, dying alone, you know, having no human comfort, of babies being separated from mothers for days, certainly at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, hopefully not anymore, because of a fear of infection, and of a, a, a complete lack of understanding the human dimension of what health in general and maternity care specifically is all about, with, you know, untold potential consequences. We're doing a big study at the moment um, across in the in the uk and the netherlands looking at the um at the effects of, of covid on organization how organizations are organized are organized around maternity care what the response was and some of the stories from some of the women who are denied companionship are absolutely heartbreaking actually particularly around ultrasound you know very very you know incredibly heartbreaking stories of women who didn't have any companions with them when they were told by an ultrasonographer that the baby had died for example or you know, or they had a blighted ovum, or whatever it was, and they had no no way of, they weren't allowed mobile phones, so they couldn't talk to anybody, and they had no companionship. Very very sad. And you know, again, certainly in the UK, and I know elsewhere in the world, there's been a lot of evidence on this notion of companionship, specifically in labour. As I say, you know, we're finding it's it's really very strong in in the antenatal period as well as being an issue. I know again you can't read the text here, but this is this is another um, paper which is actually multi-country, looking at the effect of COVID on neonatal visiting, and it found kind of unsurprisingly that there was less neonatal visiting, meaning that parents weren't allowed to see their, in many cases, see their their newborn in the neonatal unit, 
Um, um, but where neonatal units were planned better, so they were more open, there was more freedom of movement, then visiting was actually more possible. And again, this isn't necessarily a professional vocation discussion, but it is about saying we have to get the system right before a pandemic hits. There's no point in trying to resolve issues while the pandemic is there. We have to get a, a health service set up so that it's resilient when we get this kind of thing happening and resilience in terms of humanization as well as in terms of um, safety and infection control. And then in terms of maternal mental health, again, I know you can't read this one either, but you know this is basically saying, again, unsurprisingly, that women, well, actually, maybe to an extent surprisingly, actually, some women did quite well, have done quite well during COVID, not least because they've been at home. If, if you're in a country where there's been good support for people to not work when they've been locked down, I know that's not true everywhere, but where the people have had that support, they've had their partner at home if they've not been working, you know, in the same way if they've been, fun, been paid by the government for not working. Um, they've been able to breastfeed better because they've been with the baby the whole time. So they've been some very positive things for some women. But of course, the women for whom it's been worse are the poor, the marginalised, the women who didn't have social support in the first place. You know, the, the same groups as always suffer, suffered the most in, have suffered the most during COVID. And the point about this to an extent is to come to this question really. So one of the um, consequences of the lack of companionship and the fear of hospitals that has been noted anecdotally around the world and there's now emerging evidence this that this has been happening is that a number of women decided to free birth you know so if they weren't allowed they didn't want to go to the hospital um, they wanted their partner with them but their partner wasn't allowed to go with them to the hospital they they wanted a home birth but it wasn't supplied because home births were reduced because of uh, the ambulance services were overwhelmed again in many countries not you know where the world where there are home births not in the netherlands which is why we chose the netherlands to make a comparison with the uk anyway um so they free birthed because they felt there was no other way that they could actually have their partner with them and have the kind of birth they wanted and not be exposed to infection so it, for many professionals this is actually completely unacceptable. You know, it's an immoral choice because the woman's putting herself and her baby at risk. But from a vocational perspective, you know, from the point of view of wisdom, we can really, I think, we, could, we should really be able to understand why women have made this decision. And to work with those women to say, okay, how can we make this better for you so that you don't have to feel abandoned at this point in your, in your maternity journey? So, and again, you know, the, the, the COVID example is a, is a micro example of what is happening across the piece, really. So this, this whole rhetoric, certainly, again, in many countries, there's a whole rhetoric about choice, maternal choice. But really, your choice in many cases as a woman is any colour as long as it's black. So, like, you know, which is a quote from the, um, the original Ford cars. You can have any car as long as you chose any colour as long as you chose black. And this definitely was the case in COVID. Yeah, of course, you can have any kind of birth you want, you know, as long as you go to the hospital or you free birth. That's your choices. And generally speaking, that is the kind of situation that women find themselves in in maternity care um, as a whole. So the question arises about what kind of information do women make their decisions based on? And again, you know, from a, as a professional, the professional standard is to actually provide information about things that we think are important for women to know about. The reasonable person standard is, well, we'll tell you things that a reasonable person in general might think is acceptable. But actually the individual standard, if you like the vocational standard, the, you know, the, the you as a midwife in front of the woman, that particular woman at that particular time in that particular case is the one which is now supposed to be the standard in the UK legally, which is what matters to that individual is the thing that you should be discussing with them in terms of their consent or their non-consent. You know, they can equally as well refuse. That's no, nothing wrong with that. That's a legitimate choice to say, no, I, I would not, I would decline that option. Thank you very much. So I think this reflects in um, the literature around informed choice and the legal obligations that, that we may have, although I know the laws are different in different countries. And I, again, I think, you know, there, there is this, we tend to talk about, um, what is it obtaining consent or obtaining informed consent really we sh it's about women giving us that not us obtaining it, not drawing it out of them and usually you know sign here here's the informed because here's the informed consent thing so informed consent and consent in general is a kind of continuous ebb and flow it's not a one-off thing that happens all the time in that dance between the midwife and the woman and which is can be split second and changed and altered in a split second it's not something that's just a piece of paper signed at once and for all as it may be, you know, some of our professional standards may cause us to go down the line of, well, as long as we've got them to sign that bit of paper, then we're, we're covered professionally, but we're not covered vocationally under those circumstances. And this is again an example of the menu, I suppose, you know, the choice menu, 
So this is quite again quite an old study. Well, actually 2016, not so old, but I thought it was quite interesting because there's this whole rhetoric about how in Brazil women really want cesarean. The cesarean rate's high because of maternal choice. But in this case, it was um, a, two public and three private hospitals. Not huge numbers of women, but a fair number of them. And you can see their, their um, demographics here. And 8% and only 8% and 6% in the public and private sectors, respectively, preferred section rate, preferred section, interestingly, higher in the public. But actually 34, 40% of those who wanted a vaginal birth had a cesarean. So not much room for their choice there, really. Some obviously would have needed them, but and what and some would have wanted them, but not that many. And again, you know, what kind of vaginal birth is available to most women and babies? If this is the kind of vaginal birth that most women are is, avail is available to them, it's probably not surprising that a number of women will actually choose cesareans, because you know this isn't the kind of generally speaking. I mean, sometimes these kinds of births are required, and sometimes they're wanted by women, but most women, as I saw earlier on don't want these kinds of births and as the military vocation is you know when it rolls out we should be really trying to support women as much as we can and sometimes we work in very toxic systems so that's not always easy but to achieve a birth which is quite different from the one um the ones that, that are displayed here and this is illustrated in these two um this particular piece i saw this online and the heading is normal natural birth traumatized me and underneath it says, you know, something like it was traumatic, horrible, horrendous torture. I hated it. And as you read down, you realize this woman was induced. So it wasn't natural in the sense of physiological because she was induced. But she didn't because so, presumably so many women, that she, this is an American woman, so many women she knew had been induced that she couldn't differentiate that from what is physiological. Whereas the other picture here, which is also a normal birth, shows something very different. She has still got a drip in her arm, that's because it's in Belgium, but in, in, in Bulgaria. But, but you know, it's still a very different kind of experience. And I think as researchers, when we look at the data on the outcomes for, for vaginal birth, we should always say, what kind of vaginal birth are we talking about here? You know, is it a forceps? Is it a, is there, is it a, a von two? So she had an episiotomy. Was she upright and mobile the whole way through? Was she induced? Was she augmented? Because all of those things, all of that labour, is going to influence the way the woman feels about the birth and also the outcomes of that birth. So, in fact, nice the nice guidelines now have separate in their cesarean guidelines have separated the comparison between um, spontaneous vaginal birth and instrumental vaginal birth, which is interesting. And this, I think, is quite interesting. So this is this is um, some information that is sometimes given to women. This is showing um, a thousand thousand dots, showing the difference if you are induced at term plus whatever it is now, forty one plus something. The difference in stillbirth rates. So there's two little red dots there, are women who are who continue their pregnancies, and the one little red dot there is women who are induced. And it just shows. You know, it, it's doubling. So you could say the risk has doubled. But of course, when you look at it like that, it looks very different in terms of the meaning of that doubling of the risk. So I'm going to just finish off the last few slides now so we've got a bit of time for a, a conversation. Um, this is from, these quotes are from Jill Thompson's PhD. She was looking at women who had a, um, a first traumatic birth, and that included normal birth as well as cesarean, and then a following positive birth. Again, some of those were cesareans, most of them were vaginal births, spontaneous vaginal births. And in the first, when she asked the women to describe their labour and birth after their traumatic birth, they used words like trauma, um, horror, agony, rape, abuse. Those are the words they used. And when she asked them after, they used these words, joy, euphoria, fantastic, positive, amazing, in love, incredible, after their positive births. Now, that is not satisfaction. That is something much more than satisfaction. That is where the military vocation sits, in that space. Accepting that sometimes women aren't going to have, you know, the, the, we have to accept that sometimes births aren't going to go well for women, but even when they don't, even when, and as I say, some of the women using these words had caesareans, but they had caesareans where they believed they were done for good reasons and they were done compassionately and they were cared for properly. And, you know, this is where we should arguably be. So there's also evidence that actually if we do both do um, EMOC, so emergency uh, care, and we safeguard physiology, we have the best outcomes. This paper is from Ghana and it's looking at the use of facilities and what it found is that women who use facilities were not necessarily better, didn't, didn't do better. But when they use facilities that combine both safeguarding of physiology and judicious use of, of emergency obstetrics, then they did better. Both those things had to be, it wasn't either or, it was both those things that had to be in play. 
So um, watchful attendance is a term that Anke Jong and, Han, and Hannah Darlan and myself have been writing about. This is uh, Franca who put this out. Birth requires watchful attendance, not disaster preparedness. And my fear is that in, in our push towards being labelled as professionals, we sometimes veer into this disaster preparedness space. So we need to be educating for wisdom and uncertainty, management and, and capability to manage uncertainty. Again, the space where vocation sits is in uncertainty to an extent and being able to manage that with wisdom. To take into account the evidence that we know about things like continuity of carer, but to remember that you have to re replicate that evidence in the same way that the evidence was done and not take it piecemeal. So, you know, con continuity of carer throughout uh, antenatal, intrapartum, postnatal, not one or other bit of that. Building that relationship, so again, this has come out very strongly in COVID, and this is and this is actually Ebola, but any of these disasters you look at, it ends up saying, actually, you have to get your community strengthened, because if you strengthen your community, then if your hospitals collapse, you've always got the community that's going to be supportive, and there's some, there was a very um, moving paper from Italy in the early stages of the pandemic, when Italy was completely overwhelmed, the north of Italy, saying exactly the same thing, and I found looking back at SARS, the same thing was said, so community strengthening community, strengthening those relationships, strengthening the midwifery contact with women in the early stages of, you know, during pregnancy and all the way through is incredibly powerful. And of course, we have to build out inequity. So again, we, we know from the pandemic, it's been, we, we've known it before, but the pandemic has brought it into sharp focus, how much worse women do in the more marginalized groups and, and we have to stop that happening. So the advantage of getting it right, this is a quote from um, a midwife. The picture is here of somebody called Geraldine, who's actually not didn't say the quote. The quote's from a, a Dennis Walsh's birth centre ethnography. But you've given me power in my life that I could never have dreamed of. I've achieved something wonderful for the very first time, and no one can take that from me. Thank you. So, final slide: vocation and profession. Could we? combine the two in a way to move towards something that's future perfect, both for research and for practice, and for reducing inequities, and for improving outcomes for mothers and babies, and for, you know, for making sure that we provide the thing that mothers and babies and birthing people want and need. So, which I would argue is joy and human flourishing, as well as safety and well-being. So, over to you all for questions, chats, and conversation, I guess, at this point. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, there's a lot to think about in your presentation. And we have some interesting comments um, going back to uh, towards the beginning of your talk. Um, Bupe Wamba um, has commented on Africa, where she is saying the issue of vocation or the calling aspect has really cost us in Africa. We need to move to a profession because when people hear that I am a midwife because I was called to service, they start looking at us as nuns and priests and expect us to give our freely acquired gift freely and expect nothing in return. Yeah, I'm reading that. I completely agree, Bupe, and I think this, this, is the, this is the kind of paradox, because again, we were in that state. We, you know, I'm not saying that the UK is the best example of anything, but just because we, you know, the military profession has been moving towards being a profession since 1904 or whatever in the UK. And so definitely at that point, we were in that space where it was seen that it was just something that you did because you were good hearted and you did it for free. Mm. So I mean, I want to understand that 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 uh, notion, and of course, you know, ICM and all the other organisations push for us to be a profession. And this is why I say that I think we should try and move towards being both, because I think if you are just a vocation, I mean, I think we should be paid properly for our services, obviously. But if you're just a vocation, then you can be marginalised. But if you're just a profession, then you can end up being divorced from the women you serve. So we are still a service. We are we still serve the women, and I think the issue really is. In, at the same time as insisting that we have a knowledge base and that what we do makes a difference to the lives and the well-being of women and babies. And I think that's irrefutable. The, the great thing about the good evidence we have is that we can say, look, if you train the advice properly and if you support them properly and if you let them do their job properly, which is a vocation job, but if you let them do their job properly as a profession, 
you know, by, by vocation, I mean it's a job that's about relationships. It's a job about forming relationships as well as a job about having being being, being hand, having hand skills. You no, know? so it's head, hands, and heart. It's hand skills. Oh. It's coming from your heart, but it's also in, you know it's also knowledge and you know, applying knowledge in a way. So if if we can make that case, which we can now because we have got really good research, then I think it's important to make that case. And in many countries, that's the strong case that has to be made. But I think what I'm saying is, please don't lose sight of the vocation while you make that case. Because if all we end up is just being in a job, which gives us a salary, where we just follow the rules, then we won't, we won't achieve the outcomes that we want to achieve for women and babies. So right. you know, it's kind of keeping those two things in focus at the same time, really. I don't know if that answered your question. Before. Right. And Rupe also comments that um, I kind of... I, in a way, what you were just saying, that we appreciate the theories and philosophies, but we need to bring them together to formulate our own personal philosophy. I agree. And I think, you know, I think this is across the board. I mean, I, I'm going to give you a little anecdote here. You know, so a friend of mine is, uh, has just been, she's been in hospital for a couple of weeks. She's a midwife. And she's been, you know, many of you know this, this person. And she's been um, working on respectful care and compassion for you know, years and years and years. And when she went into the hospital, she was clearly septic. But the nurse involved just did a checklist. Oh, you know, this, this, this. No, you're not septic. Well, she was. And in fact, a few hours later, she was extremely ill. Now, you know, the nurse only had to look at her and to engage with her, you know, at, at the kind of level of person to person to see this. But she was doing the kind of professional thing of going down the checklist and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that's the risk I think we have to walk away from. We have to say we're not going to get tied up in this space of, you know, checklists and managerialism. We're not going to slide towards that as a profession. We're going to keep our profession focused on our vocation. I suppose is what I'm what I'm trying to. Maybe I'm not saying it very well, but that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> right, and also to reinforce your um, your discussion of issues of power with informed choice and consent. Um, you know, Celine from Canada commented on on that power differential, and. Um, how important it is to acknowledge it and frame the information um, so that it, the, the woman really is has the. She just says, "How do you, how do you frame that information?" I don't want to put words in your mouth, Celine. Um, she's proud of being a midwife, and yes, uh, Sage Farm is a midwife in French. Why, wise woman, Sasha. Wise woman, right, yes. <laughs> and Celine would love to have a Congress with it all around the theme of wisdom and midwifery. And yeah. Tammy from New Zealand is commenting as an indigenous home birth midwife, she's just reinforcing. Um, it's so true, it's not the woman that predominantly determines the outcome of her safety in birth, satisfaction, incidents of birth trauma, it's the birth attendant and birth management. Her transfer rate is far below 5% and C-section rate less than 2%. Congratulations, Tammy, that is that is amazing. Indeed, and actually, and I'm reading down as well. So, Bupe, that's, so what you've described there, Bupe, I'm very passionate about midwifery and neonatal care, I care with love. That is absolutely the point. <laughs> caring, caring with love and keeping that caring with love at the same time as making you know ensuring that, that the profession is recognized it having the space it needs to i think that's right and then coming back to the power thing because again i think that's another thing we have to be very careful of you know if you've all the anybody who's read the literature on professions will know that you know one of the um one of the cardinal um the cardinal factors of profession of a profession is it gains power so the more it professionalizes so we're talking about, you know, originally it was the church, wasn't it? And, um, and medicine and law. They were the three kind of cardinal professions. And the more they, they became professional, the more power they got and the more distance they got from those that they served. So I think that what you've written down there is, is about keeping, keeping the connection at the same time as having that um, credibility and that kind of sway with governments that you have if you have a professional, a right. professional group. Yeah. And with that, we will wrap up.